The Trail provides a boy's memoir of through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, written and read by David Smart. This book is dedicated to you, the seeker, soul searcher, and pilgrim. Prologue April 22nd, 2015 An email to friends and family back home. Email subject line, and so it begins. Hello, friends. We have arrived in San Diego. We'll be starting a long outward and inward journey tomorrow morning. We'll be thinking of you on our sojourn and providing you with some updates along the way. We would also very much enjoy updates about your lives as well. We're all journeying together, and we're all facing similar challenges. Email is a great tool, but receiving and writing letters has a magical effect. If you do decide to write or send something, please also include your address so we might have the privilege to write you back. Please use Priority Mail for more reliant deliveries. Thank you all so much for your presences. And pray to the rain gods, eh? There's a major drought over here. Cheers. Love, Bradley and David. Chapter 1 April 23rd, 2015 Bob's House in San Diego, California It's time! I groaned and turned over as my eyes fluttered open. A man's rounded figure stood in the doorway. Is today really the day? Before I could process the thought any further, Bob disappeared and the door slammed shut. Don't forget water, he called out while walking back to the house. You won't last long without it. It was the small hours of the morning, but I somehow managed to lift my head from the rickety trailer floor where I had slept the past two nights and glance toward the other end of the trailer. There sat Bradley, sitting cross-legged beside his backpack at the foot of his bed, eyes closed. I still couldn't believe today was the day I'd anxiously anticipated for the last three months. I was only 24 years of age, and my life had changed more in the last 90 days than in all the previous years combined. The corporate lifestyle just hadn't done it for me. I'd been working a digital marketing job since my college graduation two years ago, a fine job with various perks and fancy meals, but I'd begun to feel disillusioned by the, quote, real world, end quote. I felt trapped in a nine-to-five cycle of work hard, play hard. My life was far from satisfying, and I didn't like where it was heading. Much of this likely had to do with how I was spending my time. After a long day of meaningless work, my weekday afternoons were filled with workouts, yoga, and other forms of movement, simply to keep stress at bay, and my precious weekends were riddled with poor decisions involving alcohol, hangovers, noisy bars, late night texting, and sleeping with women I shouldn't have been sleeping with given my intoxicated state. But it seemed these activities were the only way to take advantage of my brief time off. A reprieve from the endless cycle that awaited me the following Monday. What I found most strange about my life was that I had saved up plenty of money. But I didn't know what I was saving for, why I was working, or what I was working toward. It seemed like I had everything I wanted in life. And yet, I still wasn't happy. Once money ceased to become my life's objective, I was left to question the purpose of my existence. My soul was being crushed, my life void of purpose, and I knew it was up to me to find a new direction. My only problem was I had no clue what else I wanted to do. I had no passions to pursue, nor any idea what another life would even look like for me. I only knew I needed something different. So, I began searching for alternatives. My most promising gig seemed to be another marketing job working for a water park with a good friend of mine. It wouldn't be the most dramatic shift, but maybe it would be just enough to make me happy. After flying down, meeting the owner, and returning with optimistic ambitions, I decided to take the leap. I quit my job. 
I hadn't gotten a final offer yet, but I was desperate for change. It was about a week after quitting and telling all my coworkers I would be working for said water park that I realized there was not going to be another job. My friend called me and told me not to do anything too crazy just yet. I was too ashamed to tell him it was already too late. My unemployment frightened me in the beginning. How would I make my way in society? How do I spend my time? What should I be working on? Life was a much different experience when there was no one else telling me what to do, and I felt caught in the paradox of choice. Fortunately, I'd saved up a chunk of change, and the lease on my room wouldn't expire for another couple months, affording me time to figure things out day by day. I decided I'd write it out while contemplating what to do next. It's been said that humans need a balance between certainty and uncertainty, between chaos and order. Too much of one, and the ship begins to sink. After my job had fallen through, it felt like I'd traded a cruise ship with a few small leaks for a bottomless canoe. A week had come and gone, and I was still sitting at my house with no job and no clue of what I was supposed to do next. That's when I called Bradley. Bradley was a college fraternity brother of mine. Being two years older than me, he was my grand big, and I was his grand little. During college, we were deeply involved in the fraternal lifestyle, playing out all the stereotypes you could think of. Drinking, smoking, promiscuity, and plenty of douchebaggery. We shotgun beers, chugged excessive amounts of hard liquor, and participated in brotherly hazing rituals to gain the affection of our peers. It may be common for many people to create distance from their college-age selves, but Bradley's change was especially noticeable, more dramatic than any of my other college friends. Upon his graduation, Bradley had joined the workforce as a junior client representative at a currency brokerage. This didn't last long. 15 months, to be exact. On a plane flight home from an overseas vacation, he had already set his mind to quitting. No two weeks' notice was necessary. The day of his return marked the beginning of his transient and nomadic lifestyle, which had continued for the past three years, ultimately leading him to the jungles of South America. From what I had heard of his travels... He had spent his time there exploring mountains, traveling far and wide, and even participating in a variety of mind-altering shaman-led ceremonies. Needless to say, he was no longer the same guy from our college days, and at the rate he was going, I couldn't imagine him ever stepping into an office again. That life intrigued me, and it was when I was sitting at home on my couch that I recalled his story curious about a man living such a life. I now felt the very same things he must have been feeling when he quit the corporate lifestyle. I found his contact details on my phone and dialed him up. You're doing what? I asked him. My eyebrows shot up. Embarking on a six-month backpacking sojourn and hiking 2,650 miles on a continuous footpath in the wilderness from Mexico to Canada? Sounded both crazy and irresponsible. Such an idea didn't surprise me. Bradley was the kind of guy who did everything with the greatest intensity. He was, to put it no other way, extreme. To him, quitting a job meant traveling to the edge of the world. Dieting meant days of fasting. And taking a walk meant hiking across the country. And yet... As extreme as Bradley was, I looked up to him. He was older, intelligent, teeming with confidence, mysterious, and much more experienced in the ways of travel and adventure than I was. I found myself thinking, as crazy as he is, maybe he has some of the answers I'm looking for. It's called the Pacific Crest Trail, brother, Bradley said, trying to relax me into the idea. I'd never heard of it. It sounded like a computer game I'd fidgeted with in my youth called Oregon Trail, where everyone ends up dying by snake bites and dysentery. 
but as he began to explain the trail to me, I felt a rush of adrenaline. Bradley had been planning the trip for months prior, already having purchased all sorts of hiking and outdoor gear, and was soon to finalize the food strategy. Apparently, I had called at just the right time. He explained that the Pacific Crest Trail, or PCT, required a resupply strategy to coordinate food shipments to post offices along the trail. We'd be hiking in the wilderness, and instead of carrying six months of food on our backs, which would be ridiculous and impossible, hikers carried four to seven days worth of food and resupplied at post offices and general stores along the way. As for water, hikers picked that up from streams, creeks, and springs. I'd never done anything remotely like this before. My most outdoorsy experience had been a three-day retreat into Texas's Big Bend National Park during the seventh grade, led by heavy adult supervision. If I were to go on this journey, there would be no parents. Only me and my homeless Jesus look-alike college fraternity brother Bradley and whoever else we encountered on the trail. To me, this was a frightening thought. I'll send you a gear list and we'll split the cost of food, Bradley said. Just make sure to purchase everything as soon as possible. My dad will be our quartermaster, so ship your food to my parents' house and we'll take care of the logistics. At least he had some things planned out, but a thousand questions still swirled in my mind. The trail sounded, well, dangerous. What about death? I asked, hoping he would immediately scoff at the notion and dismiss the concern. Is death a possibility? Death is guaranteed, isn't it? He snickered. I'm only joking, of course. Well, sort of. Sure, it's a possibility but we'll deal with that when it comes. Nearing the end of our chat, I told him I would need time to think it over and that I'd return his call at a later date. The sooner you can let me know, the better, he said. You won't regret this, brother. And with that, our call ended. I tried going about my day as usual, but it was too late. Everything had changed and I felt like a deep and permanent shift had occurred inside me that I couldn't shake. From that minute on, the trail consumed my every thought, and the idea possessed me. Perhaps this is a sign, I thought. Maybe this is what I've been looking for. Maybe the trail is exactly what I need. It seemed my only other option was to crawl back to my old job, but I was far too desperate for that. I needed something different, something that would change my life. Even though I'd never truly backpacked before, and I'd be hiking alongside the extreme tendencies of my friend Bradley, these were risks I was willing to take. That day, I decided the trail would be my next step in life. I had dialed Bradley back the next day and told him to count me in. I could hear his excitement as he began explaining our next steps. Thus began my preparations, and telling my parents was first on the list. I had already made the decision, but my parents' support meant everything to me. Bears, honey! What about the bears? I could imagine my mother gripping the phone with white knuckles and pacing around the kitchen. To her... The trail was a death trap infested with nothing but snakes, mountain lions, and bears. Every day for the weeks leading up to the hike, I received some sort of email correspondence from her containing frightening subject lines and links to articles about trail safety and the dangers of hiking in the wilderness. I couldn't blame her. It's part of a mother's job to be concerned and protective of her child. And I, too, had had these concerns at first. How dangerous is the trail? It was only after a bit of research and numerous phone calls with Bradley that I began to see how hiking the trail was much less dangerous than either my mother or I had originally believed. Apparently, there would be many other hikers on the trail along with us and a support network of trail angels a name used by trail culture to designate those who helped hikers accomplish their goal of walking to Canada. 
Trail Angels offered shelter, food, water, and transportation. Knowing others would be out there with us helped to ease my concern. And so long as we kept our distance from wild animals, kept our eyes on the trail, avoided stepping on any rattlers, and didn't do anything too stupid to get ourselves killed, we'd make it out alive. Plus, after taking into account the probabilities of car accidents in the States, it seemed I was far more likely to die an urban life. It turns out, living in the city has an opportunity cost of its own. Meanwhile, my dad wasn't convinced I'd make it past three days in the wild, offering me the option to return home if the bears didn't get me first. I deserved his skepticism, as I had never really stuck with anything in my youth. I had no credibility or experience to warrant such an endeavor. There was little I had done that a father could be proud of, apart from earning a college degree and finding post-grad employment, neither of which were wildly remarkable given my upbringing. And now, here I was, leaving all of that behind. My dad's words echoed in my mind on more than one occasion. I'm just happy you're exercising that hiking degree that I paid so much money for. His words were a dagger to my heart. But what could I say? He was right. Stepping into his shoes, I imagined it was difficult to see every dollar he'd spent seemingly tossed into a shredder. To him, I was wasting my education in pursuit of wandering the wilderness. It was a much different path from the one he must have had in mind for me for so long. It was my parents' least favorite decision I'd ever made for myself. Perhaps the only one I'd ever made. But in the end, I had their blessing, even if it was wrapped in fear and disappointment. I could tell they just wanted me to be happy. So, I'd left everything behind and gone all in to hike the trail. I sold all my possessions, leaving only a small closet of clothes at my parents' house for if and when I returned, and registered for a PCT through hiker permit a permit that granted me access to every national park along the trail. I made many trips to REI, ordered hiking gear online, and watched as boxes and boxes of stuff piled up in my room. I now owned a sleeping bag I'd never slept in, cookware I hadn't the slightest clue how to use, a tarp I didn't have the skills to pitch, and a large backpack to stuff it all into. When everything arrived, I spread out the gear onto the floor and stared in awe at the simplicity. Having stuffed it all into the backpack, I threw it over my shoulder and questioned my decision more than ever. Is this really everything I'll have for the next six months? Six months was the expected time frame for a hiker to finish the trail, and I hoped I wouldn't have to return before. I had told so many friends about the upcoming trek and I couldn't imagine the embarrassment if I ended up not finishing the trail. After finding a friend of a friend to take over my lease, I had no other options or backup plans. I was ready to change my life and find my purpose on the trail. Hopefully, I thought, this will be the right place to find purpose, if such a thing exists. The day of Bradley's arrival soon came. I picked him up from the Greyhound bus station in Dallas, Texas, three days before our flight to San Diego, where we'd begin the trail. Although we'd kept in contact for the last three years, I hardly recognized him as he stepped down from the bus onto the sidewalk. I blinked to make sure it was him. The sharp-dressed guy I once knew now looked, well, homeless. His short hair, clean-shaven face, neatly pressed polo shirt, and squeaky clean boat shoes were nowhere to be seen. In their place was a flowing mane of black hair that fell past his shoulders, a measly beard sprouting from his chin, and janky homemade rubber sandals with laces crisscrossing up his calves like some ancient Roman gladiator. His only possessions were those stuffed into a white hiker's backpack strapped high against his back. My friend looked like an apostle, straight out of the New Testament. Before we left, 
We explored Dallas for one night. Multiple people approached him, wanting him to bless them and forgive them of their sins, while others threw him the sign of the cross from a distance. What was I to make of his looks and fashion choices? Well, I guess that's just what four years of unemployment and living in the Amazonian jungles does to a person, I decided. For better or worse, this guy would be my guide on our upcoming voyage. I was frightened, intrigued, and curious for what lay ahead. So finally, the day had come as I woke up in that trailer, everything I possessed in piles on the floor. I shoved my life into a backpack, threw it over my shoulder, and followed Bradley out the trailer into the cold, dark twilight. It was a short walk from the trailer through the side yard to Bob's house. Bob Reese was our first trail angel, and for the past few nights, Bradley and I had slept in Bob's trailer, while our days were occupied with helping around the house, meeting other hikers, and preparing for departure. The amount of support, generosity, and kindness distributed by a single individual was incredible. Bob's cozy home welcomed us as we crept inside. Hikers lay passed out on the floor, while others dangled off the ends of the living room couches. They kept still as we filled our water bottles from the sink. They knew today wasn't yet their day to leave. We headed out the front door, where Bob's old van sat in the driveway on the side of a hill, ready to shuttle us to the trailhead. The view was great from up high, the city in the eastern skyline and the beach to the west. I looked away from the scenery, preceding Bradley as we climbed into the van and buckled up. Bob gripped the wheel and threw a glance over his shoulder. Sure you got everything? We nodded. Good. And we were off. Buildings towered over the highway for miles until they didn't and the city receded in the rear view before disappearing completely. With it went the fresh smell of the seaside air that once poured through the van's air conditioning. I placed my attention on the passing wilderness outside the window as distant red mountains began to surround us on all sides. We were silent, still drowsy, as we waited for sunrise. I tried forcing my eyelids open, but sleep got the best of me. My vision faded in and out until the highway turned to rock and gravel and the shaking jolted me awake. The road was precarious and narrow, climbing up the side of a mountain overlooking the valley below. I tightened my grip on my seatbelt until the path leveled off to split a new desert plateau. You two have any final questions? Bob asked, his bright eyes reflected in the rear view. None came to my mind but I knew Bradley would think of something. He always did. Bradley leaned forward in the seat next to me. Any advice if we're looking to go all the way? The car rumbled up the road, and we waited in silence as Bob thought. It won't be easy, he said, but the first step is always the hardest, and believe it or not, that step's already been taken. Yeah, why don't I believe that? Bradley laughed. I didn't believe it either. Bob chuckled. I sensed we were getting close to our arrival. The trail will test you, he said. You'll change, like it or not. It's a journey unlike any other. Change stood out to me. I could go for something like that. It was a gray, cloudy dawn as we reached the end of the road. We stopped there because we could go no further. We're here, Bob said climbing out of the van. Welcome to Campo, California. I opened the door and stepped down to the dirt. Where the hell am I? Looking around, this was indeed a distant land, maybe even the middle of nowhere. There was little to nothing here except the border, which was one long wall of barbed wire and another behind it made of corrugated fencing. Each stretched over the desert hills then vanished. A few paces north of the border stood a monument. It was four large posts made of wood, each of varying heights, painted white, and grouped together. 
The highest post boasted the trail's emblem. On another was some writing. I traced my fingers along the smoothed wood grain indentions and read the markings to myself. Southern Terminus, Pacific Crest National Scenic Trail, Mexico to Canada, 2,627 miles. This was the beginning. Hop on up for a picture, Bob said, gesturing for a phone. I handed mine over and climbed the posts with Bradley. Thanks. When I took the phone back, I noticed the battery was nearly dead, which was strange as I'd made a point to charge it overnight. I shrugged it off for the moment, as it was time to hug our photographer, say goodbye, and begin the hike. Now before you head out, Bob said, I want to tell you something. As you already know, I don't ask much of hikers. Just pay it forward, and mail me a letter if you make it to the end. He looked into our eyes and smiled. The gravity of this situation will hit you once my taillights disappear. And you'll want to go that way. He grinned, pointing away from the border. It was obvious which direction to walk, as there was only one direction we could possibly go. But I smiled, as I could tell he found a certain pleasure in saying this. We waved as Bob's van passed from sight over the horizon a trail of dust rising and disappearing into the air. We were alone. Bradley and I stood silent and still. Everything had happened so quickly. I looked off into the desert, wondering about the last time I'd seen anything so foreign. It was then that Bradley reached down, untied his sandals, and placed his bare feet against the earth. I gawked at him. Is he actually going to do it? Feels good? I asked. He exhaled deeply, his eyes narrowed, and his cheeks slid into a grin. He nodded convincingly. Bradley told me the day after I had committed to hiking the trail with him that he would be walking the trail barefoot. Are you serious? I had first asked him. The idea seemed both irresponsible and insane. What kind of crazy hippie hikes the trail barefoot? I thought. At the same time, I knew this was Bradley I was dealing with. He'd told me that hiking barefoot wasn't a big deal for him. During his time in the Patagonia Mountains, he had often hiked barefoot, and the feeling had put him in touch with the earth. He proceeded to riff on various facts and figures about how the earth emits an electromagnetic charge that offers a host of benefits like improved sleep, disease prevention, and pain relief to those who participated in grounding, and how modern society had lost this vital connection to the earth. In the grand scheme of human history, he mentioned, shoes are a relatively new invention. To each his own, I had originally thought, but the more Bradley talked about it, about his confidence in his abilities, the more it made me think, can I do that too? The thought intrigued me. What better way to connect to the earth? What better way to embody a pilgrimage? Each of us had packed shoes just in case of emergency situations, but I hadn't fully committed to barefooting just yet. I told myself I'd set the decision aside until we reached the trail, wanting to see how I felt the day of our arrival at the southern terminus. Watching the expression of relief on his face after removing his sandals was the final push I needed. Maybe I'll try this thing out after all and see how it goes. So, I reached down, untied my sandals, and set my feet against the ground. The earth was cool from the night before, and the dirt was soft beneath my soles. It was decided. I, too, would hike the PCT barefoot. If Bradley could do it, I could too. I packed away the shoes, hooked my backpack over my shoulders, buckled my chest and hip straps, and tightened them to a snug fit. The pack was heavy with a week's food and four liters of water, but I felt ready as ever to begin the walk. Mind if I say some words before we set off? Bradley asked. Sure. He grabbed my shoulders, bowed his head, and closed his eyes. 
I did the same. He took a deep breath. We're grateful to walk a new path. May our steps bring insight. May we be granted safety, caring only what serves us. We ask that we grow, remain pure, and whatever it is we are looking for, may we find it on this journey. Cheers. Silence followed. Ready? He asked, opening his eyes and nodding. Ready. Here goes nothing. As he turned and took his first northbound steps on the trail, I hung back and gave my attention to the wilderness. It was expansive. The footpath before me seemed painted by a brush, running across the hills and chasing the northern horizon. Desert surrounded the path. Desert and nothing more. But it was much more lush than I had imagined. Instead of lifeless dunes, the landscape was littered with green patches of spiky plants, cacti, and small chaparral bushes. The scene surprised me because I had intentionally limited my research of the trail, wanting to leave the novelty to my direct experience. With Bradley as my guide, I figured I'd do just fine with the lack of information. A morning breeze brushed my face. Gone were the sounds of the city, the clacking of keyboards, the chatter of office conference calls. The loudest thing for miles was the sound of the wind. Reality sank in like coins to a wishing well. You coming? He yelled, already a short distance down the path. Coming! I headed up the trail as a nervous excitement swelled inside me. Everything I'd ever wished for, worked toward, or worried about was a distant memory living a thousand miles away. I was free, truly free. All that mattered in my life were my steps. As I caught up to Bradley, he looked back and grinned. We burst out laughing. Has this trail really been here this whole time? He asked. I smiled and breathed in the early morning sky. This was a new life, a new start, and I didn't think once to look back.